Thank you all so much for coming at this early morning hour. It's nice to see you all here. My name is Erin Moberg, um, and I'm one of the presenters today. I'm Max Wilbert. And so yeah. we're here to talk to you today about the fallacy of energy efficiency as a measure to save the planet. Um, so let's begin with a little context as to how we came to consider and present on this particular topic. So in this culture, and in the environmental movement in particular, there's an increasing emphasis placed on promoting and implementing so-called energy efficiency, or green energy practices, into all areas of human life on the planet, from commerce to agriculture, from corporations to individual homes, from the economy to the legislative arena, from academia to activism. In many cases, striving toward efficiency is viewed and proposed as the only solution from the outset mainly because it effectively serves as a means to perpetuate this culture as we know and live it. In some of these contexts, our current obsession with efficiency is motivated by a genuine desire to halt climate change and the destruction of the planet. Yet at best, the proponents and practices of energy efficiency as a solution to the planet crisis conflate efficiency and sustainability. At worst, the pro-efficiency movement helps to obfuscate the real causes and impacts of human-caused climate change toward the end of maintaining capitalism and the socio-political hierarchies on which capitalism depends. We'll discuss in greater detail both the limitations and the outright harm caused by the efficiency approach later in this presentation. From a corporate and economic standpoint, efficiency is generally proposed as the only viable solution to increasingly scarce resources, population explosion, health issues, etc. In most articulations of the merits of efficiency, the focus and incentive are anthropocentric, explicitly grounded in preserving and furthering civilization, the global economy, and everyday human comforts. As activists, and also as people concerned with the health of the planet, Max and I find significant ideological and material disconnects between the realities of climate change and the oft-accepted approach of energy efficiency measures as a means to a more sustainable world and planet. In this talk, we'll first define and contextualize efficiency as a concept and a movement, Next, we'll explore how and why efficiency is an ineffective, misguided, and often harmful measure to take when addressing the impact and threats of climate change to human life and to the planet as a whole. Finally, we'll explore alternative perspectives and measures that actually resist and combat the destruction of the planet toward a more just and sustainable way of life. In this presentation, we intend to debunk the myth of economic efficiency as a means to saving the planet and argue instead that efficiency promotes and perpetuates capitalism because it aims to make more energy available for other uses. In short, we maintain that energy efficiency measures ultimately increase the amount of energy being used overall, thereby causing more harm to the planet. And just to note that for the purposes of this talk, we're taking as a foundational premise that the health of the planet is primary rather than just the health and lives of human beings. So I'll let Max take it from here to give you some context um, about efficiency and the efficiency movement. Okay. Thanks a lot, Aaron, for the introduction. Thanks, everyone, for coming. It is really early, so I appreciate you being out here. So before we get started, I want to take a quick audience poll just to see where people are at. Uh, let's imagine that we have the power to instantly change the world. And what we can do is we can make it so that all uh, car engines get 100 miles per gallon, or the equivalent of that in, in, for electric cars, or they all get one mile per gallon. So that's our choice, 100 or 1. So who thinks it would be a better idea for the planet to go to 100 immediately? Raise your hands. OK, half-ish. How about 1? A third, a quarter? OK, cool. Good starting place. So for me, this really gets to the heart of things. Uh, and the question is, is higher efficiency something we want to strive for? And so I want to define a key term to start us off. This is how the dictionary defines efficient. Up top, we've got achieving maximum productivity with minimum wasted effort or expense. This middle definition is sort of unrelated. And then the final one, preventing the wasteful use of a particular resource. So this is important that we have this defined. So go for it. This is just a title slide, but a great bandana she would quote. You can hit the next one. So this is highly efficient. The goal of a production line falls under the first definition of efficiency, achieving maximum productivity with minimum wasted effort. 
And for those of you who remember your history classes, you may remember Frederick Winslow Taylor. He was the creator of what's called scientific management, which has been a huge influence on our culture and around the world. And he was the person who realized that early artisans and guilds and, and craftspeople were highly, highly inefficient and that you could make uh, production much more efficient by streamlining the process, having each person doing one very precise, very specific task, and then passing it on down the line. And this changed the world forever. And I think it's worth noting, I learned this recently, that Taylor was a devout Quaker, and Quakers have this whole social justice thing going on, and he thought that by increasing the productivity of production, it would actually make everyone so wealthy that you could eliminate class differences and lead to a utopian society. And obviously that's not what happened, right? So I think this has some echoes in our own time around the efficiency movement. Good intentions. So, next slide. So this is even more efficient. Robots don't need breaks or salaries. They don't get sick. They don't have children. They don't go on strike. They don't get tired. They're the perfect workers, basically. And here they are making cards, right? So over the past 20 years, we've seen more and more jobs become mechanized. And, sorry? I'm sorry, 40 years. Yeah, yeah. And now we have the rise of computer learning and artificial intelligence. These are some of the hottest fields in computer science right now, so this is only going to continue and accelerate into the future. I just saw a headline the other day about, I think it was Wendy's or some fast food chain creating completely automated stores where there are no humans whatsoever. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. So it's pretty obvious to me, I don't know about the rest of you, but that factories are one of the major factors killing the planet. These are basically the engines of consumerism. On the one end of a factory like this, you have raw materials going in. That's basically the flesh of the living planet that's been ripped apart. And on the other end, you have shiny products coming out. And usually, they're used for a short time and then just get discarded and end up in the landfill. So factories like this produce pesticides, bombs, toys, cars, computers, so on. Almost anything you can think of comes out of a factory like this. Next slide. So this is an interesting case. This is the new Tesla Gigafactory in western Nevada. It's near Reno. And it's one of the largest factories in the world. It's powered by solar panels and wind turbines. And it's a state-of-the-art facility. It's producing batteries for mostly electric cars, but also grid energy storage. And it's a state-of-the-art facility. It's highly, highly efficient. So a lot of people are hailing the construction of this factory as a major victory for the planet. And Tesla and other multinational corporations are building more enormous battery factories like this around the world right now. And environmentalists are speaking out in favor of this. And I won't hide my view. I think this is an industrial atrocity that's killing the planet, no less so than any other factory. Uh, I used to be in favor of green technology like this, but my attitude has completely changed. And we don't really have time to talk too much about this, but if you want to come to another panel today, at 4 o'clock, I'm on another panel. Uh, it's also in the EMU. It might be in this room. I'm not sure. But I'll be joined by Jennifer Isel, who's a Paiute woman from the Death Valley Reservation in northern Nevada, who's been fighting against Tesla with their factory construction and lithium mining across Nevada. Um, and the harm it's causing specifically to indigenous lands, which, of course, are really all lands. Uh, and these are really global issues too. Lithium is a strategic resource these days. The price is extremely high and rising, and mining is ramping up around the world, mostly in desert areas, because that's where lithium ends up forming. So if you want to learn more about that, come to the panel at 4 o'clock. And I bring up this slide of Tesla just to show visually that there's a tension between our ideas of efficiency, what that means in the context of a global capitalist economy, and the natural world. So next slide. This is highly efficient as well. This is the port of Antwerp in Belgium. It's the second busiest port in Europe. And uh, the commodities that travel through this port from their website include toys, televisions, computers, crude oil, vegetable oil, grain, coal, iron ore, cement, sugar, sand, paper, wood, steel, cars, Yeast, buses, cranes, tractors, kerosene, 
almost anything you can think of goes through a port like this. And essentially what we're looking at here is a distribution center for the global extractive economy. And you see these all over the world. There's giant ports in Seattle, Tacoma, uh, one of the biggest ports on the West Coast in Oakland, big port in LA, all over the world. And each of these containers that's coming through here is basically a bite that's been taken out of the planet and it's being shipped around the world. And we all know that usually that material is going from the poor to the rich, from the brown to the white, from the global south to the global north, from the colonized to the colonizer. Most of you probably already know about the term free trade, how kind of twisted that language is. It's the libertarian idea of freedom, essentially. I have the freedom to become rich, and you have the freedom to become poor. And maybe there's a relationship between those two. So this port is free trade in action, and it's also highly, highly efficient. This is how you move goods around the world. So back to that first definition, one of our theses is that achieving maximum productivity is not something that the environmental movement should build a strategy around. And I think the opposite. I think most of us would probably agree that industrial capitalism already has too much productivity, in fact. Too much fossil fuels, too much consumer goods, too much population, too much suburbs, too much of everything, right? So this final definition of efficiency is the one that's actually interesting to us as environmentalists, right? Preventing the wasteful use. And I still have problems with the use of the word resource here just because I think that implies a sort of subject-object relationship. It implies that the world exists for our use. And for, you know, People talk about fisheries resources, but that's an idea that we've constructed around real living communities of fish that exist independent of our ideas of them as fisheries resources. So we think that we're being sold efficiency by the capitalist system as a solution to the problems that the same system has caused. And the efficiency that we're being sold comes with the same mindset embedded in it. It's coming from the same corporations, the same business interests, the same governments. Almost all of the efficiency schemes and technologies that we see out there today are not really aimed at reducing the overall amount of energy we're used, we use. They're aimed at making more energy available for other things and increasing productivity. So they're aimed at that first definition. And if we're going to talk about efficiency, I think it's really important that we talk about Jevons' paradox. Some of you have probably heard of this story, and it revolves around a man named William Stanley Jevons, who was an economist. He was one of the premier economists of the 19th century, and he was working in the United Kingdom at the height of the Industrial Revolution, 1860s. And he, his most famous text was a study of the coal-driven economy of the United Kingdom. And this was during a period that was the height of the empire. Uh, the entire economy was dependent on coal. Coal, you know, ground the grain. It, it pumped water out of the coal, coal mines. It powered the trains. It powered the ships, the entire war machine of the empire. So you can hit that. And you can see some of this in action here. So over the past 50 years prior to his report, steam engines had been getting much, much more efficient. It was the cutting edge of business at the time. And everyone expected that this increase in efficiency would lead to a reduction in the use of coal at the national level. But it didn't. And the reason's pretty simple. Because running more efficient steam engines could be done more cheaply, right? They didn't have to buy as much coal. And that made the businesses using them more profitable. And because this is capitalism and production is the goal, that those profits were poured back into growing. Oh, sorry about that. Those profits were plowed back into growth, which means that more efficient steam engines led directly to more growth, which caused higher overall coal use. So Jevons saw that efficiency can lead directly to higher resource use. And if we look at the global economy today, we see a similar story. So this graph really tells it well. I think it's critically important that we all understand it. We're basically looking at a 
graph of total human energy consumption from 1800 to a few years ago. And you can see it's broken down into biomass, coal, oil, natural gas, hydro, etc. And the thing to remember looking at this is that through this entire span, the efficiency with which the society uses energy has been rising, and it's been rising pretty sharply. So for example, right around 1900 was when AC power became widely adapted, the war of the currents, and AC in most uses is way more efficient than DC. In uh, the 1970s, 1980s, right around this energy crash, energy crisis period, uh, cars became much, much more efficient. Um, and of course, coal steam engines throughout this industrial revolution period were becoming much, much more efficient as well. And none of these efficiency increases change the overall picture. That trend is still rising and, and rising steeply. And this is something of a side issue, but notice uh, renewables in renewables, quote unquote, in yellow up here. They're sort of just the cherry on top, right? People have this idea that adding renewable energy means that you turn off an equivalent amount of fossil fuels, but that really isn't the case. A guy named Richard York, who's a sociology professor here at the University of Oregon, uh, he's a great guy. He's done some very high profile research on this, published in some very prestigious scientific journals, and he found that you actually, on average, need 11 times as much renewable power to turn off one unit of fossil fuels. And that's because of the production imperative, the growth imperative. Obama was supposedly one of the most progressive US presidents in a long time, but his energy strategy was called the all of the above energy strategy. You may remember this not too much different than what we're seeing with Trump. And basically, he just meant develop all these sources of energy. And if your main concern is the economy, then that makes sense. Maintaining the American lifestyle, the American empire, is basically how high can you get this number. All of the above is what makes that number grow. And we know what that energy is powering. Construction, this is Dubai, which it is mainly being built by slaves and indentured workers. Next slide. Urban expansion. Down here we've got Las Vegas, 1984, 2011. And then out here is West Eugene. Next slide. That energy is fueling transportation. This is Seattle where I grew up. This is just an average traffic day. Global finance. Next slide. Global trade, it's estimated that the 15 largest ships on the ocean today create more pollution than all of the cars in the world. That's about 800 million cars, 15 ships. Next slide. That energy is powering technology. This is a data center. So when people talk about the cloud, what they really mean is uh, the data is in these data centers, which are being built all over the world and consume huge amounts of energy. I just learned recently that. Facebook is building a new, Facebook and Apple are building new data centers in uh, one of the Nordic countries, I forget which one, but once those are completed, data centers are going to uh, use up 15% of the electricity in the entire country. Pretty shocking. And then, uh, do you oh, mind yeah. back? This is a smartphone, <coughs> just a few of the elements that go into your average smartphone, and of course, that all comes from mining usually open pit mining or strip mining, what sometimes is called mountaintop removal mining. Next slide. That energy is also powering industrial farming. This is the Great Plains from space. And what you're seeing there is basically biotic cleansing. Anything that's not for human use has been killed and replaced with things that are grown exclusively to feed human beings and industrial fishing as well. And finally, deforestation. This is a photo from here in Oregon, and most of you probably know, but there's still logging old growth here in Oregon. There's timber sale that just came up down in southwest Oregon for a big old growth sale, and that's happening all over the state. And um, so these are the sort of things 
that this energy is going towards. And like I said, every major sector of the economy has become vastly more efficient throughout this period. Whether you're talking about transportation, mining, steel production, combustion engines, farming, lighting, heating, all of these things have been getting more and more efficient and pretty rapidly. And yet the energy use overall continues to go up. Just like fossil fuel use goes up, just like erosion goes up, just like species extinction goes up. Things are getting worse. And efficiency isn't doing a thing to stop it. Because inside this system, inside an empire, there's rarely a surplus of energy. Energy always gets put to use. I think the reason we're getting confused about this is that we're using the same different word which has two different definitions. Some people, like corporations and governments, are talking about that first definition, and environmentalists are talking about the last definition. So I try to come up with a checklist for determining if efficiency improvements are likely to actually help the planet. And it's really simple, as you can see. We'll take questions at the end, just so you know. We'll, we'll take questions. paradox? Sorry? Can you explain Jenny's paradox? Yeah, we just talked about that. Really. We'll take questions at the end, please. Thank you. Uh, so this is the, the very simple checklist that I came up with for if an efficiency increase will actually help the planet. So if a given efficiency increase doesn't reduce the cost of operation and therefore lead to more profits for business and doesn't result in a flush of extra spending money for individuals in a capitalist society and doesn't free up materials or energy in a way that reduces scarcity or price of these resources for other development and doesn't itself encourage further technological escalation that may lead to further destruction of the land, and doesn't set in motion certain models of development that can have unintended consequences, then that efficiency increase may actually help the planet. So that's pretty simple, right? <coughs> and I had a hard time thinking of many examples after I came up with this checklist. I want to expand on this last one real quick about unintended consequences. I mentioned Richard York. Uh, I had lunch with him a couple months ago, and uh, we were talking about this, and this is a quote from him. And he gave uh, one great example that I can share briefly, which was in, in desert regions, like around Las Vegas, a lot of times the limiting factor on new development, new housing developments, is the absolute water availability. There's just not enough water to have, you know, to have unlimited houses. So in a situation like that, if you increase the water efficiency in each household, what you're actually doing is enabling further development to take place. You're freeing up more water. So people may go into that situation thinking, I'm saving water and that water is remaining with the planet. That water is, is there for the plants and the, the ecology of the area. But in many cases, it's not. In many cases, your good intentions are twisted and are supporting, end up supporting the same system that's killing the planet. So, you can hit the next one. I think in terms of efficiency, we need to actually be talking, instead of efficiency, sorry, I think we need to be talking about the main things that are actually killing the planet. Things like these major fossil fuel expansions and, of course, the existing fossil fuel industry the number of dams in operation, the number of mines in operation, the scale of industrial farming and fishing and logging. These are the numbers I think we need to concern ourselves with. So, and I also think we need to be asking, where does our efficiency lie? Does it lie here? Or here? The baby turtle hatching. Does it lie with this system? <laughs> Stephanie McMillan's comics are pretty biting. Or does our, fish, our uh, allegiance lie here? She's pretty snarky. I appreciate it. So the point of this talk is not only to get you to question efficiency as a method for saving the planet. We really want you to question capitalism and industrialism and civilization itself. Because yes, fossil fuels are killing the planet, but a solar, product, solar panel production facility costs around $100 million to produce, 
and produces its own set of toxins and greenhouse gases. Even the latest so-called eco-technologies are ultimately technologies of empire. They require mining and global supply chains and free trade, and all this, of course, is made possible by war and exploitation. These are not things that help the planet. They're not solutions. You may have heard this quote before. The hidden hand of the market will never work without the hidden fist. McDonald's cannot flourish without McDonald Douglas. That's a weapons manufacturer. The hidden fist that keeps the world safe for Silicon Valley's technologies is called the US Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps. And Thomas Friedman isn't my favorite person. He's ultimately in favor of globalization and capitalism, but I think that's one of the most biting quotes that I've ever heard about how the global economy works. So in the past few years, I've given talks here at Pilk about wind energy and solar panels and electric cars and similar technologies, and my conclusion has been that as solutions, these technologies are dead ends. The same is true when it comes to energy efficiency, at least on the industrial scale. Don't believe for a second that these technologies are actually going to challenge the system that is killing the planet. Don't believe it. My, uh, we all need to be using less energy. We all need to be scaling down our lifestyles and so on. But the US military is the biggest polluter on the planet. The majority of trash and pollution and destruction and consumption is driven by industry. And our personal choices aren't going to stop this system unless our personal choices are to take down that system. And I think that doubling down on industrial technology is just not a good move to make. We've been down that road before. We know where it leads. I think instead we need to start thinking systematically about how to stop the globalized industrial economy that's killing the planet. And Aaron's going to finish this off on that subject. Thanks. So yeah, I want to look first a little bit at impact and ramifications. So thinking about all of this kind of concrete data and historical context that Max has provided, what does this mean? What do we do about the fact that efficiency measures cause further harm to the planet by promoting capitalism, by promoting consumption, by promoting greater energy usage overall? So um, as radical environmentalists, um, the radical environmentalist approach highlights, you can't stop global warming without stopping the burning of oil and gas, without stopping the construction of industrial infrastructure, without the omnicidal system of this culture as a whole. Um, so a question that a lot of radical environmentalists like Max and I ask ourselves is, where is your threshold for resistance? Um, and so thinking, um, particularly given the recent U.S. presidential election, um, so many people in so many communities with a lot at stake, with a lot to lose, and not a lot of choice, have been doing a lot of the harder and riskier work as frontline activists. Latinas are taking action in courts, in the schools, in town halls. Women of color are taking action. Black and brown people are taking action. Indigenous people are taking action. And since last year's election, I've also been moved to see other people with less to lose take steps and sometimes leaps out of the spaces of privilege they occupy in order to stand up and speak up against the kinds of injustices um, that Max was describing, against violations of people of color, of women and girls, of Spanish speakers, of immigrants, of undocumented people, and so many others. And in Eugene, I've also seen many people new to activism come out to learn about direct action and community organizing because they want to defend the land they love, um, but a lot of times don't know how. And this gives me brief moments of hope, and yet I'm still afraid, I'm still terrified, um, and still very certain, like Max, that nothing short of a unified global movement of all kinds of people ready to resist and fight back to protect the land we love, the air we breathe, the water we need, and all the animals on the planet will be enough to give us any say at all at how and when this culture collapses. So as we've mentioned, some of the ramifications of environmental activists and movements dedicating themselves to promoting energy efficiency include strengthening the existing culture, i.e. industrial civilization, by correcting contradictions that stand out between ideals and practices or policy and practices within the dominant culture. And then also by providing an outlet for activist revolutionary anger that only serves to pacify us and detract us from other more materially impactful work that we could be doing as activists. So thinking about the global crises um, that we're currently facing, 
um, including deforestation, peak oil, water drawdown, soil loss, food crises, um, overfishing, desertification, and on and on. They're often framed in the media um, and in popular and academic discourse as disparate or coincidental issues. Um, we know, however, that all of these crises are interrelated. And so these are some of the ways in which we can characterize um, collectively these crises. So they're progressive, they're rapid but not instant, um, which can lead to what's called shifting baseline syndrome, as in you get accustomed to a new norm, um, a new kind of way of living, whether that's economically or culturally, and you kind of lose sight of a previous issue in terms of the destruction of the forest or water drawdown or whatever it is. Um, these crises are nonlinear, um, runaway or self-sustaining. They have long lead and lag times, which really impedes any kind of activism that's focused on long-term solutions or long-term planning. Um, they have a deeply rooted momentum and they're industrially driven and they benefit the powerful and cost the powerless, which Max did a great job of articulating. And then they often yield temporary victories, um, but permanent losses, particularly losses to the planet. So the proposed solutions to these crises often make things worse, as in the case with energy efficiency measures. So here's a quote um, by Eric McBay that really resonates with me. Um, in the book Deep Green Resistance, he writes, even though analysts who look at the big picture globally may use large amounts of data, they often refuse to ask deeper or more uncomfortable questions. And this can be, for example, the pro-biofuel movement versus petroleum, um, or the, soy, the production of soy and palm and sugarcane um, to create ethanol um, as an alternative energy solution, which eventually destroys the rainforest further, causes greater both um, environmental and human negative impact, et cetera. So let's look at some. Um, you can go to the. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's look at some traits of ineffective solutions. So things that we find just really don't work well to address this problem. So ineffective solutions tend to reinforce existing power disparities. Um, as Max talked a lot about, these solutions tend to be based on capitalism as a guiding principle and goal. So anything that has its, its primary goal to increase productivity, to make more money, is necessarily going to be an ineffective solution when it comes to the health of the planet. Um, these, if these solutions suppress autonomy or sustainability that impede profit. So for example, suggestions of voluntary changes um, for corporations to undertake are not going to be carried out because it doesn't serve their best interest to increase their profit, make more money. Um, they rely on techno fixes or technological and political elites. Um, for example, photovoltaic solar panels, which in the process of creating them uses more energy, causes further environmental harm. Um, they encourage consumption and increasing consumption and population growth. They attempt to solve one problem without regard to the interconnected problems, as I mentioned, so solving the energy crisis with corn-derived ethanol, thereby destroying more land, causing water drawdown, and also with a very low yield of ethanol after all of that um, process. They involve great delay and postponed action, so I think a good example of this is the Paris Climate Accords um, that were reached last year. Um, so every day, the gap between human population and the Earth's carrying capacity increases. And so having goals that are set for 2025 or 2050, um, by the time we even get there, um, the, that gap will be exponentially even greater. So not very effective. Um, they tend to focus on changing individual lifestyles. Um, and some of the comics that we've shown from Stephanie McMillan and Derek Jensen, I like this book because it really gets at, in a pretty satirical and sarcastic way, this focus on individual things like buying more light bulbs. Um, and a lot of it's focused on this consumer aspect. So if you buy more of the right things, you can save the planet. Um, they tend to be based on token, symbolic, or trivial actions. So, for example, acknowledging this reality, acknowledging the problem of industrial civilization, and then the only action that an organization or a group of people take is to sign a petition um, or to grow their own food. Those things might be great things for us as far as individuals in, in terms of consciousness raising and finding community and expressing ourselves, but they are very disconnected from the material impact of human civilization on the planet. Um, they tend to be focused on superficial or secondary causes, for example, focusing on overpopulation instead of overconsumption. And for this particular point, it also tends to be a very racist approach to looking at how to save the planet, because when you focus on overpopulation, the blame tends to be 
given to indigenous communities, brown and black communities, um, who have the most to lose and the least control over the system that we've created, the, this culture of empire. Um, and then finally, these ineffective solutions tend to not be consonant with the severity of the problem, the window of time available to act, or the number of people expected to act. I'm going to the next slide. So um, this is also from this book, As the World Burns. Um, and so the woman here says, wouldn't it be wonderful if life were this simple? The problems we face so easily solvable. Every cell in my body wants for recycling to save the day, wants for shorter showers to save enough water for the rivers to run free. And then the crow says, but they won't. You know that. Fish and turtles and beavers and frogs and bears know that. Everybody knows that. And she says, sometimes we forget. Um, so I think this is kind of a good framing of a lot of the well-intentioned and maybe misguided information that we have as people, um, and then kind of shifting our focus to include and consider all life on the planet with human beings as a part of that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, what effective solutions could look like. This is obviously a broad topic. We don't have any neat and easy um, go out and do this and you can tackle this problem kind of solutions, but we want to at least offer some guiding principles and hopes to generate discussions today with your organizations or your networks. So effective solutions um, need to address root problems with global understanding. We need to acknowledge the interconnected aspect of all of these crises that are occurring around the planet from the source of the problem. Um, they involve a higher level of strategic rigor with a tangible strategy. Um, they also en enable many different people toward, to work toward addressing the problem, um, which is something I'll talk about in the conclusion today, really asking yourself, what are you able to risk? Um, what can you offer? Can you risk your body? Can you risk your family? Can you risk your job or not? And kind of locating yourself on that spectrum and figuring out how people can best use their skills um, toward, toward the end of stopping the climate crisis. Um, effective solutions are suitable to the scale of the problem, the lead time for action, and the number of people expected to act. So if you know to pull off a blockade of a coal train, you need 25 people to make this action happen, and you don't have 25 people, then plan a different action, right? Or if you have an action that you're thinking of that you need hundreds of people, and you know you're not going to get hundreds of people, then plan a different action. Be realistic about the people that you have. Um, they tend to involve immediate action and long-term action planning. Um, make maximum use of available levers and fulcrums, as in actions plan to make as big of an impact as possible, um, playing to the strengths of the people involved in targeting the weaknesses of the system. And then finally, work directly and indirectly to take down civilization, which is our kind of overall perspective of what this all means. Okay. So let's think about some alternative approaches um, and talking a bit about the words reform and revolution. So um, reformists and people that advocate for reform, change through reform, tend to consider the existing system as functional but flawed and believe it can be modified or changed to address the issue at hand, for in this case, um, the climate crisis. And so reformists tend to be willing to employ legal and socio-politically sanctioned approaches to changing the system or addressing the problem, for example, um, at things that happen in the legislative arena um, or petitions, um, trying to change laws, grassroots organizing, that type of campaign. Um, and reformists tend to focus on separate issues, um, not necessarily on the entire intersectional issues that are happening. Um, and there are some limitations to this that we've pointed out. Um, for example, correcting contradictions within the system or redirecting our revolutionary anger to less materially impactful um, uh, solutions. On the other hand, though, yeah, yeah, solutions. <laughs> solutions. <laughs> On the other hand, though, we do want to make it clear that we think that both of these things, revolution and reform, can have a place um, in the type of activism we're advocating for. So revolutionists tend to consider the existing system to be at the root of the problem and believe that it must be dismantled and replaced to address the issues at hand. And that's kind of where Max and I are at. Um, revolutionists tend to be willing to employ resistance strategies through whatever means are most effective. So rather than working within a particular legal framework, um, revolutionists tend to be willing to employ strategies that may or may not be legal toward the end of saving the planet or halting the, the climate crisis. Um, and revolutionists tend to see the system and the culture as the primary issue rather than something to be reformed or fixed. 
So we advocate that those working toward reform and those working toward revolution or anywhere within that spectrum identify points of overlap in their goals and strategies in, in order to better work together. Um, and I think today is a good example of that, walking in and seeing all of these hundreds of tables um, of different organizations at PELC, which on one hand is great to see so many people come out. And on the other hand, think about all those kind of separate, disconnected um, strategies and groups of people that have a lot of passion and experience and skills and energy. So finding ways to really bring um, people from the entire spectrum of activism together. Um, this might look like activists who utilize legislative channels to prevent the shipment of fossil fuels through their municipality, while frontline activists block coal trains and offer direct action trainings to train others to how to do those same actions. Um, so what do we mean by fighting back? We mean thinking and feeling for ourselves, finding who and what we love, figuring out how to defend what we love, and using any means necessary and appropriate. So this involves calling out the problem, in this case the dire circumstances caused by industrial civilization for life on the planet, identifying a goal, for example, depriving the rich or the powerful of the ability to steal and the power to destroy the planet, and then coming up with a strategy, so defending and rebuilding just and sustainable human communities within repaired and restored land bases. Big goal, definitely. Um, so. Let's move on to the conclusion here, and then we'll take some time for questions and discussions. So in our communities and around the world, great people are doing great work in the name of environmental activism and saving the planet. More people are marching in protest than the year before, than the decade before. More people are writing letters and signing petitions and making calls and organizing at a grassroots level. More people are seeing clearly and more people are learning the language to speak about what they see. And yet, more animals go extinct every day, and more areas of the earth become uninhabitable for so many animals, including humans. The salmon are dying, the forests are dying, the rivers are dying, and the oceans are dying, and people are dying all around the world. In recent years and since the US election, more people are speaking out vis-a-vis -vis the climate crisis through social media, in town halls, in their homes, and neighborhoods and schools. And yet, the earth's temperature rose again last year and the Bramble Cays Malomas went extinct due to climate change last year, and the San Cristobal Vermilion Flycatcher went extinct last year, the Rav's Tree Frog went extinct, and the Stephens Riffle Beetle, and the Tatum Cave Beetle, and the Barbelos Racer Snake, and 13 more bird species went extinct, and the list goes on. So as environmental activists, we know what's at stake, all life on the planet, and we know too that an environmental and cultural movement grounded in energy efficiency is simply put not enough, and often incites further planetary harm. So I'd like to read a quote posted on social media by one of my favorite writers and thinkers um, just a week and a half ago. Um, her name is Rebecca Solnit, and she's a US writer, feminist, philosopher, um, and activist. And so she posted this, um, kind of thinking about the election and, and where to go from here, and also about the climate crisis. She says, our country is now headed by white supremacist, nativist, misogynist, climate-denying, nature-hating authoritarians mm -hmm. who want to destroy whatever was ever democratic and generous-spirited in this country meaning that it's a good time to not let the perfect be the enemy of the good, to keep your eyes on the prize, and to commit to the long-term process of taking it all back. Because even after Trump topples, which could happen soon, remaking the stories and the structures is a long-term project that matters. It is not ever going to finish, so you can pace yourself, celebrate milestones and victories, and get over any idea of arrival and going home. Most of the change will be incremental and the lives of, the mo of most change makers show us people who persisted for decades, whether or not the way forward looked clear, easy, or even possible. This is also a remarkable moment in which many people you and I might have disagreed with in safer times are also horrified, are allies in some of the important work to be done, and worth reaching out to find what we have in common. The word emergency comes from emerge, to rise out of, the opposite of merge, which comes from mergere, to be within or under a liquid, immersed, submerged. An emergency is a separation from the familiar, a sudden emergence into a new atmosphere, one that often demands we ourselves rise to the occasion. This is an emergency. How will you emerge, she concludes. So you can go to the next slide. Um, we'll leave you with a brief analysis of a poem by Adrian Rich. If you don't know her, she's a US poet, essayist, and radical feminist who died just a few years ago. Um, and this poem is called North American Time, and it's taken from a collection published in 1986, in which she argues for a kind of ethical imagination that I think applies to our argument for moving beyond energy efficiency toward the end of halting climate change and the destruction of the planet. 
So the poem begins as the speaker, a woman of color, reflects on her growing realization of having been systematically silenced and pacified by the culture of empire. When my dreams showed signs of becoming politically correct, no unruly images escaping beyond border. When walking in the street, I found my themes cut out for me, knew what I would not report for fear of enemy's usage. Then I began to wonder. The speaker of the poem continues on to describe the power and permanency of written words and of the verbal privilege in being able to write or to act in a public enduring way. In the third section, the speaker challenges the reader to do the impossible, to try to imagine herself outside the context of history, of planetary life, of accountability. And so I've cut some sections here. She goes on to say, try telling yourself you are not accountable to the life of your tribe, the breath of your planet. It doesn't matter what you think. Words are found responsible. All you can do is choose them or choose to remain silent. Or you never had a choice, which is why the words that do stand are responsible. And this is verbal privilege. Here and throughout the poem, Rich calls out the silent bystander, the privileged witness who sees and knows that great injustice is being perpetrated and yet doesn't speak, doesn't act, doesn't intervene. Central to this poem is Rich's profound understanding that words rather than thoughts are ultimately found responsible. And I think the same holds true for actions in the context of environmental activism. Our actions will be what endures, not the thoughts we had or the plans we made or the feelings we had about the destruction of the planet. Also central to this poem is Rich's compelling portrayal of the disjuncture between those who have a choice or more privilege and those who don't. And I would ask you all to try to identify where you locate yourselves within that spectrum. Um, as activists, we need to first understand our own relative privileges and then acknowledge that these privileges being male, being white, being an English speaker, being a citizen, being wealthy, um, et cetera, are not innate, are not innate privileges. They're a direct result of the culture of empire, of a culture grounded in institutionalized racism and misogyny and omnicide. The salmon who have all but disappeared didn't have a choice. The Kalapuya whose land we occupy here today didn't have a choice. The forests don't have a choice, nor the bees, nor the rivers. What choices do you all have? We encourage all of you to reflect on these words as a call to action, as a call to reevaluate the words we use and the stances we take, to assess whether or not they truly coincide with our deepest, most intimate hope for the future of ourselves, of the planet, and of this world. We ask all of you to think long and hard about how you'd like to emerge, and then we ask you to act in a way that feels intentional and possible and significant to you, and most importantly, for all life on this planet. Thank you. So we'd love to take questions and discussion. I want to um, make a kind of request here that you keep your questions succinct and direct um, as actual questions. And if you're someone who tends to take up a lot of space and take up a lot of time when speaking, consider stepping back. And if you're someone who often is stepping back and not able to articulate yourself, consider stepping forward. Thank you. Sure, yeah. I'd like to know how to get that chart, a copy of that chart. I can send it to you. Just write. The second thing is, um, is there any country, Scandinavia, they've done a great deal more than other countries, I think, as far as reducing fossil fuels. I could be wrong, but I believe they have. They, they're building standards. You never build a building like this in Scandinavia today. Um, and uh, cancer, you can just go in the health of things. Cancer is now almost one in two. Right. And it, I think it's quite related to what we have. I've always worked in the health care and the fact on the mission. So um, I think they're very related. Absolutely. And I'm very pleased. But I, I know some communities around here have reduced their emissions by 80%. And I don't know if health, the health of the people in the community. But um, I just was wondering. So you're wondering if there are other like countries that provide alternative models? Is that what you're asking? Right. Mm -hmm. And also, if um, you related it all to health effects, mm -hmm. and how can I get that chart? <laughs> yes, we can definitely get you the chart. Yeah, just um, give your email to one of us. Yeah. After we're done. We also have a table. We're tabling um, deep green resistance in the main lobby. If you want to stop by there too. Do you have any thoughts on the, the sure. country? Sure. Um, 
Well, one thing I would say is just that, first of all, a lot of the wealth in the Nordic countries does come from oil, the North Sea oil fields. Norway, for example, is sort of a poster child for efficiency and being very eco-modern, and pretty much all of their wealth comes from oil, ultimately, uh, most of which is exported. So they may be all driving these fancy electric cars, a lot of which come from these places like this gigafactory and are shipped around the world to get there. Um, but I think ultimately it's more about people feeling good and, uh, and not, not so much has actually changed as they would like you to think. And another example is I learned recently that a lot of the electricity sources in Scandinavia specifically comes from incinerating garbage for energy and they actually import garbage from other countries in the region and incinerate it as an energy source. And um, Not good. so that's a thing. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that that was happening. <laughs> but yeah, yeah as far as health, I think you're absolutely right. And I'd love to see more people in the uh, medical field really speaking out about that. There are definitely some. I used to live in Salt Lake City and there was a group called Utah Physicians for Clean Air and they really were active in speaking out against the mining and tar sands and the industry in the area. Um, but it's surprising. It just seems like a, it's just like a cycle, you know? People get sick and then they go into the medical system and what do they do with all those gloves and syringes and IV bags and all that stuff? That goes straight into a medical incinerator and it becomes dioxins and furans and these highly toxic substances that go right out and cause more cancer. And it's just an, it's just a plastic industry. The medical industry is a plastic industry these days. And if you want some recommendations for things you could read on that topic, I could we could chat after. Um, as far as like articles or books that kind of address the health component too. I think you were next, and then you, yeah. So I, I by and large agree with your overall framing of the discussion. I mean, there's probably like some equivalents here and there. And there's so much stuff to talk about. But the question that came to my mind as like a long time activist is that given that seven part set of criteria for an activist of activism, um, how do you assess deep green resistance effectiveness based on those criteria? Yeah, I think uh, that's a good question. Not, uh, not necessarily awesome. I mean, I think we're losing just like everyone else is losing right now. So I definitely don't, th I mean, I don't know what you would say, but. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that to me is different in terms of the radical activism that I do with Deep Green Resistance and just as a radical feminist is that we're not um, spending a lot of our time on some of these other less materially impactful efforts. That being said, it's, you know, it's a fairly small international group of a lot of really um, passionate and skilled people, but it can be it can be isolating. Um, and like actions, for example, like stopping a coal train that I mentioned. Yeah, you can measure the impact. Okay, on dollars lost, right, or the impact that it had on the industry if you stop a coal train for ten hours, um, which is an action that you've probably read about happening more around the world. What impact does that have on the longer term um, health of the planet? It's it's sort of hard to to have any kind of quantitative data to assess that. Right. I think though that one of the things that can be really useful is doing more of like train the trainers type um, direct action trainings which is something that we're offering one this spring if you're interested um, and that TGR does in different places around the country and around the world. So to really train people to offer the same types of advanced direct action training so that people can combine skills whether it's like tree climbing or making lock boxes or you know radical feminism and how that works within an organization and lots of other things so I think that to me is a more effective use of the time but like I said you're not going to necessarily see a short-term impact and how I feel personally is I know these facts I know that this is what's happening I know that the climate is in crisis and that human beings have caused it and so my to me my choice feels like I could do nothing and go about my life, or I could at least be honest and open and do something and perhaps have some agency in how everything kind of ends up collapsing or whatever ends up happening with the planet. That's kind of my personal stake. Yeah, yeah and just to add two more things. One, I think that's part of the reason why we threw in the reform and revolution slide, because, for, like, for example, I have some friends who, I know, I have a friend who works 
or used to work at Center for Biological Diversity and still volunteers with them. And he's done all these lawsuits like protecting endangered species. And on the one hand, I'm like, that is so much more tangible than, you know, the work that I'm doing, sort of trying to build revolution against industrial civilization. It's it's a lot more tangible and and sort of something you can really grasp and get your hands on and, and achieve in a, sh in a more short time frame. Um, so that's one thing. And the other thing is that I heard a quote years ago that was from somebody who was on the National Security Council at the time. And I think this was during the Arab Spring uprisings. And the quote was, beforehand all revolutions seem impossible, afterwards all revolutions seem inevitable. And I take great heart from that quote because uh, because it seems impossible right now, and um, and I don't think that's any reason not to fight for large-scale revolutionary change. Uh, because you never know when the situation is going to change, you know, and all of a sudden the conditions are going to be right. Um, so that's it. And I will say that if you're someone who's, and then we can take other questions, if you're someone who's feeling like you've kind of wanted to learn more information about about radical activism and you just feel disconnected from it and you don't know who exists and who's doing what, um, we can definitely clue you in if you're from here. Um, we have an active group here in Eugene and in, in Oregon if you're from other places too. Um, I think sometimes like a huge barrier can just be like who is doing what and how do I check it out and become a part of it. So... We're happy to talk with you or stop by our table later, too, if you want to. And then I think you were actually next, and then you, yeah, in the red sweater. Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> <clears throat> I haven't spoken yet today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, so the part that I keep coming to is, is that as long as people are buying the oil, they're going to keep shipping it. So... It just, I mean, I, I think all, all of the actions are good, but it just seems like if there were some kind of, and, and, and what you said about, like, if I drive my car less, that means other people are going to drive their more, right. and so we should all just not do anything, but it seems to me that there ought to be a way that more people can understand. Mm -hmm. It feels like people don't get the connection mm -hmm. between... But, but you need a lot of people to do it, obviously, because if just one or two mm -hmm. or a few people do it, I don't know. I mean, how does that fit in? How do you yeah, I think the educational or pedagogical component is really important, um, which is why we do things like this talk and try to create um, like databases of information and free access to materials. And that's one of the things that like train the trainer type trainings can be really useful for, because then you can bring that information back. To your, to your organization, but I agree. I mean, from schools to just local communities to other like liberal activists to the far right. I mean, it's there's a kind of a void of information, and it feels really daunting to even make a dent mm -hmm. well, in that. To like information, I mean, I don't know. I mean, what does it take to inspire people to stop buying stuff and right. you know mm -hmm. stop driving and, and to I don't know. Because I, I think a lot of people probably feel that way. It's like, well, right. I shouldn't drive, but everybody else mm -hmm. is, and it's not making a dent anyway, so I'm just, I don't know. I, I mean, I hear what you're saying, and I feel like, this is kind of silly, but one of my favorite quotes is uh, from an old Tupac song, and he says, don't blame me, I was given this world, I didn't make it. And I really like that quote, because Tupac has this reputation as sort of like a gangbanger, and you know, being really out there and and promoting violence and all this stuff and has this, like, gangster reputation. But, um, like, the reality is he was born into extreme poverty and born in, you know, born as a, you know, a black boy growing up in white supremacist American society. And I think I love that quote because that's how I feel about being born into car culture. Don't blame me. I was given this world. I didn't make it. And that's how I feel about the majority of people who are out there driving their cars and, you know, going about life even though they're using oil, even though they're contributing to consumerism and all these things. It's not, it's not our fault as individuals. We were given this world. And I don't think that we should feel bad for being forced to participate in this system because it's so hard to not. It's so hard to not participate. It's nearly impossible to not participate. And especially if you're poor, if you're, you know, a single parent, 
you know, if you have to work multiple jobs, all these things, like, you're, you know, you're not going to have the money to worry about organic food. You're not going to have the time to, you know, walk right. or ride your I bike and all these things. Right. And situation, people may not be able to cut back, but the people who can cut back, if enough of them cut back, you know. I right. Think and to, right. just to finish what I was saying, I think that people who can definitely should, just as a personal moral decision, but I think that what, what that all points to to me is that we need to actually intervene in the systems that are responsible for these things and not try and mobilize a mass movement to change our personal behaviors in order. I think it's a very different approach. And, you know, I mean, in a sense, Gene Sharp, who's one of the nonviolent uh, resistance theorists, uh, he's probably the the top nonviolent theorist of all time. He's written a bunch of books about nonviolent revolutions and so on. And, and he says you need to think about nonviolent social change as a form of warfare. And uh, because that's what it is. We're fighting an empire. It's genocidal. It's ecocidal. It's extremely violent and brutal. It's re willing to use whatever methods necessary to achieve what it wants. And even if we're going to be completely nonviolent, which I don't believe we should necessarily be all the time, but that's beside the point. Even if we're going to be completely nonviolent, I think we need to think ourselves as being in a form of conflict. So I think that's the switch, is from thinking as if we're only thinking about ourselves as consumers, and that's how they want us to think about ourselves. That's how capitalism wants us to self-define, is as consumers, and our power is to buy or to not buy. I think we need to define ourselves as human beings or as animals and say that we can do whatever we want. And in this situation, our home is being destroyed and we need to intervene in the system that's destroying the planet. And so I think it's about shifting that mindset from consumer, from a consumer focus to defending the planet that we love and the communities that we love. So, yeah. yeah I think you were next. I don't think so. Um, I'm just curious about the leading at the moment. Um, I'm just curious about anything in this recent history that you need to be defining that to the press important inflection points or energies that can be, you know, banned. It seems like banned in other words, there are a lot of parts of it, there's a lot of parts of it, there are a lot of parts of it, or something like conflict. It seems to me that there's a lot of conflict that's coming. So I want to be like, I think one thing that we're kind of focusing on with our local and regional chapter right now as radical activists is connecting with other people who have historically been involved in primarily like pacifist liberal activism, so things like petitions and protests and marches and that type of stuff. We've seen more people actually reaching out to us wanting to like get some more facts, get information, figure out like what is direct action. And a huge part of that, I think, is debunking this myth of direct action as this violatory, aggressive, savage-seeming thing, right? Um, I agree with Max that I don't think that um, nonviolence is the only approach, but I also think that violence and violation or force and violation are often conflated. And so I wouldn't say I feel optimistic, but I, it has been nice to have some new members coming on and just people who are willing to think about what does radical activism mean and just normalize that type of action and language, um, I think we should use the, that energy that you're kind of, or the shift that you're describing right now as much as possible. Was there a hand over here yeah. first? Was there a hand over here first? I don't know who was first. <laughs> okay, we'll let them since you oh, asked uh, one. Uh, yeah, Jevin. Are you talking about Jevin's paradox? Oh. Uh, you know, Eli Whitney, the guy who invented the cotton uh, gin, he was an anti-slavery oh. guy, right? And there's a heartbreaking letter he wrote to a friend where he said the cotton gin is going to make uh, cotton harvesting three times as fast. And he said in 10 years, two-thirds of the slaves are going to be freed because they won't need them, right? Because everything will be three times as fast. They only need one-third of the slaves. And, of course, ten years later, there were three times as many slaves because they were doing it as much. But uh, he was heartbroken over it, and there were letters of him regretting it and all that. But and people say that the invention of the cotton yeah, gin was one yeah. of the major causes of the Civil War. Yeah, yeah but it's just a great because example of, he thought slavery. that, yeah, you know, if it was three times as fast, they just that, get rid you know, of two-thirds of the people, but actually they just did three times as much, and it made everything a lot worse. But that's just an example I always think of Jen's paradox. That's just an example I always think of Jen's paradox. Yeah, it's a good example. Thanks. Yeah, I was just wondering... Do you have a question or comment? Yeah, I was just wondering what civilization was smashed in 
what do you do with, uh, let's say conservative, what do you have with, uh, let's say conservative and you have the people who want to get on board? Well, I mean, well, yeah, you can go. It's <laughs> a big question. Uh, I don't have the answers. I don't have all the answers. I don't think anyone has all the answers or like a perfect vision of what the utopian society looks like. And I think part of the reason for that is just that the world is a huge place and people have to live very differently in different areas. And um, I mean, as far as the people who won't get on board, I mean, as far as the people who won't get on board, they say during the civil rights movement, about 3% of the American population was actively working for civil rights. And, you know, honestly, sort of at this point, I feel like if you're not going to get on board with the fact that the planet is being killed, then fuck you, honestly. Like, I mean, not even fuck you, just sort of like, I'm not really interested in like having that much of a conversation or relationship with you. It's just like, what is there to talk about? We could talk about the Super Bowl and the comeback, how cool that was or something. I don't know. I mean, I don't... I say that and that sounds callous and at the same time I'm like, I'm willing to have a relationship with anyone and talk with anyone, discuss these issues and try and figure out if we can get to, you know, I think that even moving somebody from like really conservative to slightly less conservative, that's a victory, you know, if you can do that, if you can, so, I don't know. I would just say, I mean, I agree with Max, I don't really know, but I think shifting the focus from an anthropocentric um, lens to just thinking about life on Earth planet as a whole, it doesn't really matter what happens to me, like with people particularly, it's hard to wrap your mind around that, of course, as an individual, like with an ego, that's like terrifying. And um, I think that there are lots of models, um, you know, of indigenous communities that existed for centuries and centuries, um, actually sustainably, and what that word really means, um, kind of in concert with all the other animals in nature. So I feel like, you know, utopically or ideally it would be small communities of people that could live where they're living and know the history of that place and know what lives and grows there um, but I don't think it's going to be like a clean <laughs> um, hopeful kind of coming of age and just just to add one more thing it's just that some people accuse DGR of wanting the world's population to die off because we advocate for bringing down industrial civilization and the reality is a lot of people are dependent on it but um I have a few friends who live in India, for example, and I you know, talk to them about these things and <coughs> ask them what would happen to the poor people in India if civilization collapsed and the global industrial economy collapsed, and they say the vast majority of people would be better off immediately because you have these industrial farms going in. The, the land is owned by corporations, so the poor farmers don't own any land. They can't, they can't survive. They're forced into the city into these wage jobs. So first of all, I think that's a big part of it. But the other thing I would just say is that I think the population issue is one reason why I think feminism is so important because um, because the reason we have that's the reason why we have such high population is because we live in a patriarchy. Yeah, no, I, I get that question. Mm-hmm. And I also think that's why we need to be doing anti-fascist organizing and community organizing. And honestly, that's why I support leftists having guns and being armed. Like, yeah, I understand that guns are really a touchy subject on the left, but... You know, I mean, the reality is there are 300 plus million guns in this country and they're pretty much all owned by right-wing assholes at this point. Mm -hmm. And, like, that's not a good recipe for, like, the future. (laughs) Uh, So, you know, I support, like, I mean, in a magical world, I wish I could just snap my fingers and, like, only the feminists would have, have guns. Like, feminist women would have guns and nobody else would have any guns. Like, that would be the ideal situation. Maybe. Or something like that, but I mean that's not the reality. So, since we're almost out of time, I want to make sure we get to both of you because you had your hands raised. Um, did you? Yeah. Um, I'm just about thinking about even the comments said about the um, people that are just a big part of that. 
do is a big part of the work like that obviously we need to do is organizing with ourselves. Like obviously we need to start organizing with ourselves. Also going out and the community. Talking to people. Also going out and talking to people. And even like changing our own spirit. And even like changing our own spirit. You can persuade them. In order to just, you know, sway them. Instead of looking at ourselves. Staying within 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 ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And for me, as someone who used to identify as a liberal activist and a pacifist and a vegetarian and a lot of other things, like kind of to come to the point that I'm at now, I totally get that. Where I kind of draw the line is, is the energy that I'm expending either with my, you know, with articulating something or spending time at an event or an activity or engaging, is it ultimately leading to something materially impactful? Um, or is it, is it me kind of watering down things um, and detracting from other more meaningful work I could be doing? And that's true as for radical feminism in particular. So it's been hard for me to learn that it is not my responsibility, nor should I have to be forced to explain to every misogynist I encounter, and they are innumerable, you know, what, femini what feminism is and why they're in the wrong. So I think that that's kind of, to some degree, an individual decision, like where that divide is. I also think, though, within the entire movement um, of radical environmentalism and, and DGR, um, there can be times where you're ending up inadvertently using up your revolutionary anger, like we kind of talked about before, and then you get to the end of an exchange with someone or a connection you tried to make with a group and realize, but wait a minute, this whole thing is focused on people. Um, and so for me, if something is ultimately just focused on people, preserving the lives of people, I'm kind of out at that point. Um, not that I, you know, I don't know. I'm more so I'm just going to stay neutral and move on to other things. Um, I would articulate maybe a little differently than Max. I kind of like hedged yeah. when I said I kind of like hedged when I said fuck you. And, and so now I'm going to hedge more and say, like, I drew a little diagram. So I guess just what I meant is that, like, we're... The radicals are like this tiny little sliver of the population, and just throwing a totally random number about there, maybe 50% of the people out there in this country are people who I feel like we can talk to or like are going to have some success with. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm just saying we should focus our energy there, where it's going to have the best effect. And like, I'm not actually saying we should say fuck you to all those people, even though a lot of them are the misogynists and the racists and super assholes, and those ones we should say fuck you to. <laughs> But, I mean, that said, yeah, that's, that's a lot. I think we maybe have time for your question or comment before we have to wrap up. On your slide for the solutions, I was wondering how you know, uh, talks about uh, shifting the bonus switches. So, we back from Houston, Texas. So, we have been with the North, the Pacific Northwest, and the Northeast. Tend to be more proactive when it comes to finding solutions to the sound system. Mm -hmm. But in the South, there's this lack of resources and a lack of attention mm -hmm. because of the fear of not winning. So you have your larger range, range 350, that never really should focus towards the Gulf Coast mm -hmm. because you're not going to win those states. Same reason why you had, you know, the Democratic Party not really spend a lot of resources to turn yeah. down in the South. So we're in your effective solutions. How important would it be to redistribute resources as in human capital, fiscal, just resources in general to help uplift those most marginalized populations that are shut out because of, of their poor I think that's mm -hmm. very important. And I, also think that I think that's very important. And I also think that one thing I'm wary of is trying to impose like solutions or kind of grassroots movements or projects into areas for which that kind of framework doesn't work. So I'm really passionate about those kind of solutions and frameworks. Like, of course, people collaborating or bringing in other people or trainers from other regions, but coming from that region, you know, for example, like if there's an indigenous community in an area that, that lives in a particular way and knows like how to live in that particular way, the kind of approach to whatever activism happens coming from that rather than being imposed, um, I think... It is true in the South, too, and then particularly in areas um, with lots of people of color and with other marginalized groups. We, I think we see a lot in liberal environmentalism, these white middle class movements kind of being like superimposed in areas for which they don't have any resonance um, and then ultimately perpetuating the dominant hierarchies, the dominant structures. 
so I don't know that I have a really specific answer, but I do think that that's generally kind of, can, can be an issue in terms of what methods and solutions work where. Are you, are you uh, from the Tejas group by chance? Okay, I think I saw you on the schedule and I was like, oh cool, because I've met um, one. Yeah. I spent a little time at the, I want, I, maybe it was your office years ago in Manchester, remember, by the refineries right there and everything. Anyway, that's total side point, but, um, yeah, that's a good yeah, question. I agree. Um, I think it's important and I think it's hard. Yeah. And I think, thank you all for coming. I, I, I also think that in some ways, <laughs> I also feel like in some ways, because the political, the general political yeah. situation is shifted to the right more, that maybe it's a more fertile ground for more revolutionary solutions. Because it's sort of like, like you said, the legislative stuff, the reform-oriented change is just not going to be able to gain as much traction there just because of the culture. Mm. Mm. But that said, like, when I spent time in Houston, I loved all the activists I met, and everyone just felt like they were super down and really solid. And sort of because they were in the belly of the beast, they had, it seemed like they had a great analysis. And were just, yeah, that's true, too. Like, really understood how bad things were and how the power system worked. And everything.
Yeah. Oh, so like on behalf, like defending environmental laws on behalf of the federal government or something.